sister said, we, we slow but we show. <laughs> this uh, project, it took a few years to complete at the time that I originally did it. But before I get started, let me also thank Ami. <laughs> thank you for having me here. Um, I guess we're going to talk a little bit about this, uh, what you've just seen, and I hope you have some questions. Um, but I'm, first I want to correct a little bit of something that a lot of people have asked me about in terms of the, the timing that uh, gets printed 72, 1972 to 73 to 1980. And that just happens to be a question of the issue called access. And uh, since this, I think this program is the beginning of talking about early video. And uh, back in those days, it was very hard to get access. And uh, I just happened to have gotten <clears throat> access to a porter pack through a uh, workshop on the Venice Boardwalk. Uh, and one of my contemporaries that is credited in the, in the making of this, Michael Zingali, he just kept asking me, man, you ought to check out this workshop. And I said, well, at the time, I was painting a mural on the boardwalk in Venice, and I said, well, you know, I got my wall to keep me warm. But uh, eventually, I, I went to the workshop, and uh, you could rent this equipment uh, from the workshop, which was really an, a, a, an unbelievable opportunity. I'm, while I've got this moment here, let me see if I can find this note that I... Oh, here it is. Uh, there was a group of guys, and some of you who might have been around back in those days, this is like early 70s. Uh, there was a group, eventually they became called Environmental uh, Communications. And some of them, those members, there's a guy named Dan Zimbaldi, Paul Shalacone, John Baker, and John Hunt. John Hunt was known as Dr. Video. Uh, I just wanted to see that because back in, in that time as an independent uh, media maker, uh, getting access to the technology wasn't that easy. Unless you were working at an institution, which I eventually did myself, to actually edit uh, the project uh, in its totality. But uh, you might have seen in certain sections, in particular in the music section when I was shooting war, what now would be called jump cuts. And I learned something about editing while I was shooting that scene because I wanted to change the camera position and since it was just one camera, I would turn the camera off, and then I'd turn it back on. But I had to count the measures of the beat so that if I turned it off, I could come back into the song where it would not be so noticeable that I had turned it off. And just real quick, this was your very first yes. video. Ever. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and the, the crew that was with me, the, like I said, uh, we would trade different uh, times holding and doing the shooting with the camera. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that were being presented. And I must say also, a lot of people that are in this documentary no longer are with us. Cecil Ferguson, in particular, uh, 
Claude Booker, uh, a lot of the, those, 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 those people had a lot to do with uh, the, be the beginnings of the African American arts community here in LA. And uh, if you saw in that exhibition, uh, Richard, are you here tonight? Where, where are you, Richard? Richard Wyatt. who is a, really a well-known painter these days. And uh, I mean, if you've ever seen Capitol Records and the mural that has a large image of uh, Miles Davis, Richard uh, did that painting. And he's done some other really great uh, paintings as well. Um, but as I was about to also say that the social political realities they still even exist today, and 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 when the reason why this notion about the the police as it related to the Watts riots, you also had the burgeoning activities of the Black Panthers. Uh, you saw a lot of the the children at the parade going like this and everything. Uh, it. It, it was, a, it was an, a, an interesting time in, in, in terms of whether or not, that's why when I was asking Cecil in regards to about the commercial support, you find this commercial support, I think I see it anyway, when I see how the city set up the subway system and how when it goes through the hood, it goes in a particular way in which it goes. In some ways, it doesn't even go through the black communities. It goes down Crenshaw. That's not the whole of the black community. It does not go to Watts, okay? And, uh, and then since we're talking about context. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. And we're shouting people out. Um, Ron Wilkins is here as well, who was a Slauson who organized around the rebellion and, um, and yes, yeah, quite a bit. Yes, sir. And he was also the uh, West Coast chair, California chair of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Many members of the Slossons went on to become really politicized, including, of course, Ron, who did a lot of incredible work. I, I'm, I'm so lucky because Ulysses and Ron are like my teachers, and um, they never got paid for it. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm very, very privileged for that. So also Ron is here that, um, you know, also told me about the context of the time and that the rebellion actually, 39 people. Yeah. 39 people were killed as a result of, <clears throat> pardon me, as a result of the repressive state tactics. And also, uh, the following year, I think it was the second year of the Watts Summer Festival, police came in and flying over in a helicopter and riddled part of the park with bullets and about five people, was it five people got killed that year? 1968, okay. yeah. Okay. So, so the context continued, it continued. Um, you know, the police being involved and also training, you know, the, you know, some of the sons of Watts to be paramilitary, et cetera. So there was always that pervasive element, and you were really asking that of, of uh, Cecil for, uh, you, you, you dug in right there, and I, I, you know, that was really interesting. So when you talk about context, um, you know, I, I really wanna know about that too. And also, another thing, and we'll probably get back to it, is the way that, that you shot everyday people. Yeah. That you didn't focus on the celebrity notions of the Watts Summer Festival. You were shooting everyday people. Well, the thing about this um, documentary, it sometimes gets, gets lost, and at the same time, people tend to think that the film that they made, Watts Fest, they think that that was the festival. And that was a large music concert at the Coliseum that they brought the notions of the Watts Festival 
to the Colosseum. And uh, I mean, I'm not trying to put the movie down because it is an amazing uh, set of uh, performances there. Uh, but this is, I think, hopefully representative of more of what the, the people in the community were trying to do. I mean, it was really about community uh, self-empowerment. And it was controversial, right? Because I think that some of the people that were politically involved were also not in agreement with this. So there was a bit of controversy going on. In well, that. yeah. Um, well, the, that, that whole notion of the conflicts that arise, I think just... See, that, I think that's what I was trying to get Cecil to even engage in because of the notion of uh, the, what, what money brings to the community yeah, yeah. and how that tries to start to shape who is in control. And I think that, uh, you know, it does mention there was another one. I don't know how many people here might have been around and when, they used, when they, the, one, of the, one of the persons in the film mentioned it. In the, in the documentary, The Festival in Black. And The Festival in Black would usually follow the Watts Festival. And, uh, and, it, and I think The Festival in Black would happen around Labor Day weekend. So it was sort of a continuum of this, this kind of African-American celebration by the community. Um, I think Today, I did, 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 I mean, Ron, do you, do you know more about uh, possibly what might be still going on in, in the community of Watts? Watts sure, Arizona's please. The, the, the film, unfortunately, does not commemorate the Watts Rebellion. There you go, right? I don't know. Yeah. In fact, to bring in the police with PR booths, and recruitment boots to bring in the military, the very elements that those in the streets, and I was at the center of it from the very first day, I stood next to Leon Posey, who was probably the first casualty in doing the rebellion, uh, community casualty. What I'm saying is that the, the Watch Rebellion, I mean, the, the Watch Sun Festival became, for many of us, it was a blood stained circus tent. Okay. Not pay honor those who fought police and the military, and in an unprecedented way, they are the unprecedented unity that took place in the community to fight these elements. And what the festival did under the leadership of Tommy G. Kennedy, that new Tommy Will, is brought in those very elements that we sought to punish, to destroy, to mm -hmm. drive out of the community. It brought them in and showcased them. It even had a booth there for the Watts Century Freeway, which today is the 105 Freeway. Yeah. Uh, it made my mama move. He lived 116, 56 Spring Street. Well, I <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> yes, hey, that's really you. nice. Is it working? Yeah, okay. we hear you. But we uh, we fought hard, and at no time during the Watts Summer Festival were the the, the casualties their identities or their names presented, uh, which is, see, the, the uh, commemoration of the rebellion should have had two elements. One, to celebrate and to praise those who fought and unified to take on the system. And secondly, to, to honor and uh, memorialize those community fatalities from the uh, six-year-old boy to the 63-year-old man. None of that was ever done. Tommy Jaquette drew down a big salary. Yes, uh, yes. Oh, it was terrible. Yeah, it was so terrible. there was a lot of controversy at the time. And then also, I do want to go back. You were saying, is there anything like that going on? And I do want to address that. They actually, I, our sister center, I run the William Grant Still Arts Center in West Adams, if any of you have been there. Yeah, please. And some of my colleagues are here, and I know Ron is, is uh, Ron and Ulysses both really advise us with a lot of what we do there. Um, but the Watts Towers Art Center has the uh, Day of the Drum coming up in September. Um, it's the last, last weekend of September, as well as the Watts Towers um, 
jazz festival. So that is still continuing. And what, what happened, as, I think, as a result of all of this discourse that was going on, numerous festivals did happen, right? Because it went on, and you actually became the documentarian of the William Grant Still Arts Center, our very first yes. documentarian. So, so it, it was a rebellion, and I feel like a lot of people, um, a lot of people, uh, I guess I want to say they, they discuss it as though it was, it was an entirely violent event. But out of that came this man right here who went on to do so much work and this man right here and lots and lots and lots of other programs and, and um, out of the struggles of that, lots and lots of other programs and also arts festivals, right? Yes, well, I, I really appreciate what you're saying, Ron, because what you're talking about was a conflict that I was having in actually making it. And uh, that's why I was trying to get at Cecil to get to those kinds of uh, contexts to, because as you were saying, there, there were these conflicts uh, in terms of Tommy Jaquette and the funding and how that funding was being distributed, uh, not alone, not you know necessarily getting to honor those people who had who had lost their lives, um, but you know this unfortunately with the low budget <laughs> way in which I was working, uh, I tried to get as much material as I could to release commemorate the event. And in that sense, that's where the title comes from, just remnants. I wish you would have brought your cameras and your crew to the commemorations of the Watch Rebellion that a number of us put on. Uh-huh. Seriously, we used to put them on at, at Watts Towers Arts Center when John Outerbridge was the director. Right. I, and we, we did it on an annual basis. Yeah. You know, we talked about people like Joe Nelson Bridget. You all should know Joe Nelson Bridget came out of Slauson. He was 22 years old. He was the 22nd fatality during the Watch Rebellion. He went out like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. He was on Florence wow. inside a store. He had already wounded sheriffs who were outside. He came out with a pistol in each hand firing, and they literally, the sheriffs that had uh, placed themselves outside literally cut him in half with a shotgun blast. But we, on an annual basis, we gave out the Joe Nelson Bridget Award for Valor to the person in the community that stood up best against police terror in the year running up to when we would commemorate the rebellion. We did all those things, and we wish there was a film, crew, film crews that would film that. But all that has been suppressed. And unfortunately, this theater complex, we call it Holly Weird, because Hollywood ain't never got nothing right. And they've <laughs> lied. All this Disneyland and all them people, the people who have done everything to defame and put down our people and our struggles, came back with booths at the, at the festival. And that's what this theater, and I'm going to say it, I can say it, yeah, because I'm, I'm not an invited guest here. I'm just up in here, <laughs> all right? This, 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 this complex is part of the disinformation campaign in this country that continues to put down struggle. One of the other things that really bothered me in this thing is this whole notion of black police and black people in the military, even black people being in the political running of this country. To have a black skin, to be uh, a member of the ruling circles in this country makes you a class enemy of the exploited the dominated, the oppressed black population in this country. And one of the things that needs to happen, and we need to, and one of the things that people in this country need to come around to, and the movement needs to come around to, is we need to take power away from those with the power that have so, have used it so barbarous, barbarically and uh, selfishly. We have to take the power away instead of trying to put some black person in somewhere, anyway. Don't let me get, <laughs> let, me, let me shut up because it's thank, your fault. No, but thank this, you. is, this, is, this is pathetic. This is, this is uh, really bothersome that we've come so far and we've gained so little in all this time. 
Well, and so that's that's inspiration. And and I also want to think about, I, I, I do want to go to actually certain elements of Ulysses' film and that that how how many people were actually using video in 1972 to document everyday people in Watts? If from from a black perspective. Well that's uh that's an interesting question, just because I don't know if there were that many, if there were any other than the crew that I took to watch. Um, because uh, all the points that, that you're making, Ron, uh, I was, like I said, I was conflicted putting together those images of the, of the military and, 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 on, and what that was being said about their participation at the festival because, of course, when, when I came to the festival, I wasn't looking for those people. And I didn't know of, uh, how pertinent that was. Once again, that was why I was trying to get Cecil to make commentary along those lines. And he was avoiding actually answering that, any of those kinds of issues. And that was shot in 1980 with Cecil. Yeah, that was yeah, that's when that was shot. But so, and Miriam, his wife. So. Yes, yes. But you know, I, I, I mean, unfortunately, when it comes to speaking truth, we tend to find ourselves sometimes wearing this uniform called political correctness. And uh, what, what, what Ron is saying is, is the truth. I mean, that's the thing that uh, is hard for us to get out these days. And we see that now with the political arena. As we've got a whole segment of society that's afraid of the truth. So, I don't know, anybody getting indicted in here? I, I do have, I, I, someone actually recently gave me a really great, um, a really great booklet. I, 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 I have the digitized format of it, but a really great booklet that was written by one of the participants named Crook that, um, that uh, wrote a, a, a scathing critique of, of the festival as well, and then presented options. And so, so I feel like, but, but okay, so there's that. There's so much going on in my head. And then, and then there's, there's um, looking at the art too, and going into the room where some of the artists were. Great, I mean, to see Greg Pitts at, at that oh, yeah, age well, too. I'm, I mean, I hate to stop you right there, but when you said, mentioned Greg, I mean, Greg actually is, was a, was a classmate of mine, and actually, if you've ever seen my video, uh, Two Zone Transfer, he was, he was in, that, in, that beat, in that video. But uh, once again, we say alms to Greg, who is no longer with us. Absolutely, absolutely. Such an incredible, kind, and generous man. And so there's all these artists throughout. So, so there's, there's so much generosity. I think that's what I wanted to get to. So there's generosity. There's the generosity of someone actually writing a booklet, spending their time, someone who's very young, writing a critique of the festival, to the generosity of people like Charles White, who mentored numerous black artists, including yourself. Greg Pitts, who created numerous programs, including ones at my art center, William Grant Still Art Center, curating exhibitions, giving opportunities to so many artists. So tell me about the generosity you felt when you were having conversations at that time documenting people you know, that, that were trying to make the art too. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Richard, and it's, who was here actually uh, was, portrayed himself, obviously, in, in, in a documentary. And I was just really, really surprised of the work that he was doing. And how old were you then? OK. Wow. wow. And, and the skill, too. Like yeah, 15. yeah. Well, you know, there's some real well-known artists that were in that exhibition, and like they were saying at that time, which most people tend to not realize, uh, black artists couldn't get museum shows back in those days. As a matter of fact, I had a painting in that uh, exhibition. You might have seen that guy giving a finger. 
Yeah, that was me. I knew that was you. I knew it. <laughs> It was a self-portrait I did of myself standing in the middle of the road, naked, uh, standing on the double lines of the road. And you know what that means. Uh, the double lines in your highway means you cannot pass. You can't pass the lanes. And so uh, I just stood there with the finger. Uh, <clears throat> but no, but you know, you see Betty Sarr's work is in that, sh in that show. And uh, just, I thought that what uh, Claude Booker did in terms of walking around and describing the works and uh, giving you an idea, I mean, to, to, to whatever degree, Greg was also talking about a, 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 an arts workshop at the Watts Art Center. And to, to, see, and to see the fact that people, the, they were, I presume the young people that were trying to do conceptual art uh, of that time uh, it was the thing that I thought. What actually seeing it later on here, when somebody had made a package of cool cigarettes, you know, the cancer maker. I mean, you know, if you know anything about the, the campaign for trying to stop cancer in the in in in, in low uh, economic communities, is to stop smoking menthol cigarettes. And uh, I thought, wow, man, I I really didn't pay attention to that at the time. But uh, I'm gonna stop running my mouth. See if y'all got any questions. <laughs> Comments? <laughs> uh, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, what's up, man? My name is Akil. Uh, I'm a younger brother. I'm, well, the younger brother. Uh, but first off, thank you. Uh, it was, I wasn't even going to come here. I had no idea this was even going on. My, my homie hit me up and just went to read the description. I was like, yeah, I'm trying to check it out. Uh, brother Ron, uh, I do not know you, but if I may, I have a response. Um, I was having a conversation with my parents one time, and I'm not a soldier. Uh, in the American military, but it was over soccer. And we had lost one soccer game, and they were in the stands observing. And the time that they, that they like while we were discussing how and why we lost, they said some things that made me very upset. And in that time, uh, a phrase came to me, and that phrase was, soldiers are always gonna remember the battle differently than anybody else observing. They're gonna remember the details, and they're gonna look back and, and, and feel the presence of being in that situation. Um, and so I cannot say that I feel your pain because what you described is wild, bro. What you described that you saw with your own eyes is something that I haven't even come close to. But I, I hear your pain. I hear it sincerely. Thank you for grabbing that mic and speaking the truth. Thank you for grabbing that mic and sharing your pain with us. My response to that is first and foremost, I'm sorry, bro. I'm sorry that you had to experience that and experience a festival where your fellow soldiers were not uh, committed. I'm sorry that I had to hear that. I'm sorry that you had to go through it. But I also hear the sister saying, I'm sorry, sister, I came late. I do not hear your name. I'm sorry. I'm Matisse. Matisse. Uh, I'm Matisse. Uh, Akil, thank you. Uh, I also hear what she's saying, how much life comes out of situations like that when, when the soil is, is, is saturated with the blood of the brothers like you, even though people that come back to enjoy the fruits of that sacrifice may not always be uh, have the same respect as the people that sacrificed. And yes, it does also attract bees, uh, but still, there are opportunities out of that soil. And for that reason, we gotta say thank you. Uh, thank you for everything that you did. Thank you for your sacrifice. I'm sorry that this, for this particular moment was the moment where you felt the fullness of the commemoration. Uh, the phrase that you said was dope. Uh, I've never heard a, a bloodstained circus tent. That's dope. I'm not gonna use that. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a cool phraseology, man. I'm sorry that you had experienced that, but I'm so thankful uh, to hear that some art, some festivals, some black happiness came out of it. And even I feel if they had taken all the time they could to truly commemorate you, it couldn't be nearly what you deserve. It couldn't be nearly what a match for what you had to experience because the soldier is always going to remember the battle differently than the people deserving. I appreciate your comments, but I, I, I must say, the United States, and this is going to rock some people in here, the United States is a criminal empire. It began 
with stolen labor on stolen land. It made its way with genocide, colonization, the enslavement of peoples. That is the history of this country. And everywhere this country has put its military forces, it's about, it has been about taking people's land, keeping people uh, impoverished, taking their resources. Right now, West Africa is getting ready to explode because West Africans have more, so many of them have more political sophistication than we do. They're saying the French have to go, the, they already got the British out of a lot of places, that the U.S. has to go. They took down a ruler in Niger who was black because he was, uh, co he had cozied up to the French in the United States and Africans are saying, uh, go back to your land and how is it that we have all these resources but our people are impoverished throughout the African continent and it's turning around and we, we need to take lessons from our brothers and sisters in West Africa. I'm loving it. I'm loving this thing with BRICS where they're saying that the United States, the, the U.S. dollar is no longer going to be paramount in the world. More nations are signing on with the Ch Russians, the Chinese, uh, India, Brazil, and so on. And we need to be looking at that. And we need to be motivated by that. Most of us are so busy looking in these damn cell phones every day and smoking weed and playing loud music and cutting the other people off in traffic. I feel I say, called but, out you right know, now. That's what they do. Y'all know, you know what I'm talking about. It's this, this country done gone insane. It's this place, is crazy. I'm, I'm trying to get out. I'm trying to find some, and I'll probably end up in West Africa. And let me just say this, and I'll shut up. Okay. I found out in the 1980s that the FBI has listed me in what they call the Militant Black Extremist Index. They even said I was armed and dangerous. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. Because I'm, the, I'm their enemy. I'm an enemy of this damn government. Yes. And I will take it to the grave. Because that is the responsibility I owe my ancestors. Is to take struggle, take struggle to the grave. And I've worked with some of the best, some of the most serious revolutionaries in this country, and that's, when I'm, that's, that's the way I'm going out. So, all right, thank you. all right. Hello. Hi, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Jenkins, for the work that you have um, been doing. Um, and what we were able to see here today. I'm a, a transplant to Los Angeles from Oakland. <laughs> um, so, and, and I, yeah, I just, yeah. yeah, I appreciate, you know, all of the, the historical pieces that we can see. I, and I understand the, the pain and, you know, everything that is, um, that goes into our work, you know. And as somebody who grew up, you know, making documenting stuff back in the Bay Area too, and just knowing, you know, what, so, what feels like that responsibility to so what's capture your, What's your name? Excuse me, again. Oh, my name is Janelle. Okay, Janelle. <laughs> yeah, ahead. but I just, I just wanted to say uh, how much I appreciate that, the work that you've done and what was presented and just getting that peak, you know, not being there at the time and um, hearing the names, you know, people like Outer Bridge, who, you know, I've been able to see his work over the years and stuff here in South LA, but... Um, I just I wanted to ask about the organization that you worked with. I think it was Venice uh, yeah. Arts. Yeah, just how it's that a little collective. Came, oh, okay. How that came about, and um, you know, how uh, were you able to get resources to make uh, projects like this happen? Well, it was the first video project that I actually organized and 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 was able to produce. And the people that you saw credited at the end, they were my friends. Uh, for, the, for the most part, if you got a chance, any of you, to see my uh, retrospective, that's how my career actually uh, was constructed, with my associations with my friends. And, uh, you know, being an independent media maker and video artist, so-called, uh, you weren't always able to, to get funding, and um, which was mentioned in the introduction here. I was, I've been fortunate enough to have won a few 
awards from the NEA and things of that sort, which allowed me to actually get paid something. And uh, when I had my retrospective, I was at least able to uh, say thank you to all the people who were collaborating with my uh, later collective called Other Vision Studio. And in that sense, Other Visions was the way that uh, we operated. Matter of fact, May Sun is one of our members. She's here tonight. Um, it's, uh, as, an, as an independent media artist, uh, you just uh, use another phrase, by any means necessary to get that work made. In teaching, right? Well, yeah, many, well, the, many the, the years teaching, of teaching. Was, is, is the only other way that I ever was able to continue to work. As a matter of fact, it was going into the educational uh, environment as a profession as a professional, as a matter of fact, that's, that's how I was able to actually continue to produce my work. And influencing so many artists. I mean, Corey Newkirk, uh, Mario Ibarra Jr. Um, I'm trying to thank all, Lita Abdul. Well, Those were a, all my friends. That's how yeah, I well, there's a, in the there's, there's so. a There might be a few in this audience. I don't know. Probably, <laughs> but, uh, probably some, some of the influential uh, artists currently that, that came out of your mentorship. Yeah. Well, all... All I would like to say, without getting all puffed up about it, is that uh, my mentors, who you've mentioned, Charles White, uh, really gave me a way of re-examining my purpose as an artist. And uh, if you know his work, he had lots of themes that uh, were very pivotal in man, manifesting uh, the African-American experience. But the thing that he was teaching us was how the African-American experience was so universal. And Ron, when you're talking about West Africa, I've been listening to all the news coming out of there. And uh, the, the whole realities around the colonialization of Africa that unfortunately still kind of goes on. I mean, these days you've got the Russians and, and the Chinese coming in to try to grab up all those uh, resources. As a matter of fact, USA has been doing it as well, but, you know, it's, it's the, the narrative of this of this planet, you know, and um, until we can take a real good look, I hate to sound like Michael Jackson looking in the mirror, and take a look at take a look at ourselves, at what we are doing to ourselves. Uh, that's 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 the thing that I could say about that. But I I want to get back to you. I mean you. <laughs> The time that I spent in Oakland was so amazing for me at the time that I was living there and to, you know, still meet people who philosophically had really in, 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 in ingested the Panthers. Uh, I don't know how many people really, I mean, Ron, you would know how much influence the Panthers had had in, 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 in South LA. Uh oh, you opened up another can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> because he was Snick, so go on. We had an alliance with the Panther Party for a time. That's, That's what I thought. The Panthers were a great organization in many ways, and they, and they had so many brave soldiers, men and women. Right. Yeah. That, that I, I, knew, I knew all the Panther leadership, but the Panthers had two fatal errors. One of them is what we used to call loose recruitment. Anybody that showed up with a pistol and was angry at the system, said he wanted to be a Panther, he let them in. 
instead of doing a background check. On right, so right. In the Panther Party. The other mistake, major mistake, we have to, we have to say this critically. We have to be open and straightforward about it. They were the Black Panther Party for self-defense. You don't fight a monstrosity like the United States with all its resources and capability. Uh, face up. You have to fight what's called the War of the Flea. The Panthers talked about the rule of warfare but didn't carry it out. You have to attack your enemy from behind. You attack him at night. You attack him when he's not expecting it. You don't go slap the police on the corner and go around talking about today's pig is tomorrow's bacon, and then you run into a building with sandbag walls and let the police just wait you out and gas you out and kill some of your members at the same time. That, those were the fatal errors of the Panther Party. Okay. Let me tell you something else. Your friend. I, my mentor was James Foreman, who was the old, but one we call the old man in the student I brought in the final me. I learned so much from Jim. And Jim Foreman was, uh, what was I gonna say about that? Uh, he was the one that actually uh, promoted uh, the, the alliance between the, the Panther Party and SNCC more strongly than anybody else in the organization. But uh, I, was, I forgot what I was gonna say about Jim. <laughs> well, with your points, the points that, I'm sorry, I mean, were you going to say something? I was going to say, Ron does also have a book coming out with all his photographs. And, and, and I've, I've been around the world, I've met so many great leaders. I met Muhammad Farah Adi. Y'all know who he is? Yeah. Some of you know, yes, and you probably some police in here, certainly know. <laughs> <laughs> Muhammad Farah Adi, the film Black Hawk Down was made about him. It was uh, the U.S. military was trying to get into Kampala. Native they were trying to get into uh, Mogadishu, Somalia, to kill him, to capture him and kill him. His people in one day took out, took down two U.S. Black Hawk helicopters and 19 of the most advanced U.S. troops. And Bill Clinton, who was president, ordered the United States troops out of Somalia at that point. He's the only African leader. And I'm, I'm, I'm probably one of the oldest in this room. He's the only African leader in my lifetime and the lifetimes of everybody else in here, I think, that has actually defeated the U.S. military. And when you said something about China and Russia going into Africa, China and Russia never colonized any country in Africa. Russia just forgave Africa, African nations, for all its debt that it owes to Russia. And the only time the United States, aside from Adi defeating them, the only time the United States was defeated in international conflict was in Vietnam and with North Korea. And in each time, it was the North Koreans and the Vietnamese who had Chinese foot soldiers who had their backs. And so I got much love for China. We got to get past the, the Western propaganda that's telling us that they're coming in to take the resources. They never tell us. You have to be clear about it. Okay. All right. I'm just short. I studied it. Teach. Thank you, Hey, Ulysses. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> yes, Richard. I just wanted to say, man, how proud I am of you. Um, I think that was the first time I met you at the Watch Festival. Right, right. The, the art festival, which was put together by Cecil Ferguson and Clyde Booker. Yeah. And uh, I remember you came in there with this big box of science fiction called a uh, video recorder or whatever. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> you know, it was just amazing at that point in my life. You could say I was 15, 16. And, you know, I was just really um, struck and influenced by, by art. And having been around so many influential and really gifted artists at that time really had a major impact on me and I'm glad you were able to capture a moment of that um, and you talk about like Betty and David Hammonds and all, all of which including myself were <clears throat> excuse me disciples of Charles White and um, uh, to me that was I think you really captured that that within that segment of that art scene which was, which was just beginning and thank God for Cecil and and Clyde, who did not have access to galleries and museums, they put on shows in gymnasiums, churches, parks. Like you mentioned, the festival in Black. I think that was in MacArthur's Park. Um, 
kind of annually, and it came short, uh, shortly after the uh, the um, Watt Summer That's Festival. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, it's just so much. It was a story that uh, Cecil told me years ago where they wanted to do an exhibition on the Black Panthers, and they actually went down to the, I think the headquarters was on Central, the one where they had the big shootout. <clears throat> and he went down there and says, well, you know, we want to do a show, and we like to, you know, it's an art show, and... He went in there, and I forget the guy's name who it was, but the guy who was who they had the meeting with says, well, you know, that's fine, but you want to see some real art. And he pulled out, like, all these photographs of all these brothers that got killed. Wow. You know, and, you know, and um, that, I remember that had a major, major, major impact on him, you know. But um, I, I just want to uh, really <clears throat> uh, thank you. I mean, it just brought back so many memories, man, like that. Uh, John Riddle piece surveillance, man. <laughs> yes, man. well, that still goes oh, oh, on. Man. Yeah, you know, and to go from there and see what a lot of those artists have done, and then you got this whole new generation of artists. Who, I remember one thing that that uh, John Riddle told me too. He said, you know, you know, there are many ways to uh, to fight oppression, and it says if you're gonna, you can do it with your art as well too, you know, and so. You know, it was it it was really an exciting time, that whole period of time during the uh, late '60s, early '70s. And uh, once again, I want to uh, say, man, how 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 proud of I am of you, man. Well, yeah. uh, I thank you, Richard. Yeah. Um, when you were saying all that, I also came to the conclusion that I want to say something about John Otterbridge who actually, uh, I think he was the founder of the Watts Towers. Yes, he was. Yes. And uh, he's, of course, no longer with us. But uh, John was a major influence on me that when I came back to L.A. from doing my undergraduate studies at Southern U in Baton Rouge, and I was looking for some way of getting a job in the arts community and I was of course knocking at the tower's door and he told me to go up to Barnsdall and uh, actually I got a little start as a person who was putting paintings on the walls and stuff up there um, but you know there are, there are lots of stories that are untold about the art scene in the minority communities, especially the black community. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be in part of certain uh, uh, art uh, events that have I've been included in. But, uh, you know, I was having this conversation earlier today uh, with a good friend of mine here, Peter Kirby, and we talked about how the relationship of the arts community and this thing that we just experienced. And, uh, you know, I'll just say as a, as a media artist, uh, this is the pivotal way that you would like to see your work presented. Uh, I've been in a show where they wanted to show my work on a laptop. So, you know, that's a, that's a whole nother description of the, the way in which people either think that, you know, we'll just show your work in something that we have access to and uh, doesn't do the work full. Uh, it's fullness. I hope, I hope that this, this video uh, did give you a chance to see what it was like uh, to shoot video back in those days. Uh, it's, a little, it's a little degraded from the original uh, that, was, that was shot on half-inch videotape. Um, How much did your equipment weigh? I was wondering that. Well, you know, it was, it, was, it was like, a you know, the way we did it and the way that I shot that is you put the porta pack in a, uh, 
an overnight bag and your on and put it on your back, and <clears throat> then you had a your your camera looked like a machine gun. And that's how big those the pieces of equipment was. And uh, you actually had to be in good shape to actually maneuver, maneuver with it, you know? But uh, if, uh, I don't know if I can, if I've described the whole circumstance that, as I described it, but, uh, you know, you guys got all kinds of different things today that's right on your cell phone. Yes, Nancy. Um, I just wanted to say, when you started out and made this piece, you were working with public access, right? And that is something that was so important. And it was really a way that it was centralized for people to work together. And there were also programs, like my dear colleague, Mike Zinzin, made his message to the grassroots for 10 years. It came out on a, a public access channel in, in Pasadena, and we used to actually take the videotapes and mail them to other public access places all over the country and then finally all over the world. And in a sense, we have too much now. We don't have, in a way, to me, we don't have that kind of community um, spark that happened with the public access right. experience. Right, well, you know, what you're describing in terms of, that's, some, that's another kind of, of uh, accent on the understanding of how all of us early video artists began. I mean, to, us, to that extent, public access was the most uh, applicable opportunity to get your hands on the equipment. And uh, of course, the whole notion of editing, if, if you were lucky enough to have uh, a cable station that had editing equipment, then you would actually be able to edit your videos. I mean, some people, just for those people who are not familiar with how the early days went, some people would actually try to edit their videos with scissors and t scotch tape. And uh, of course, the thing about doing that, if you did that incorrectly, the tape would mess up the heads of your machine and you would never be able to see the video again anyway. But, uh, yeah, you were gonna say something on me? Um, no, I was just- uh, Oh, a hand, uh, okay. Nadia over there who has her hand up. Um, okay, um, my name's Nadia, hi. Um, <laughs> so, I just wanted to um, what I've seen um, is the overarching theme, or like an overarching theme of this conversation so far is um, the contrast between the um, positive impact of this event and which we've seen through your ability to capture it, um, to capture like the, the joy that and empowerment that the individual people experience through their test, like that we saw through their testimonies um, and the way that it was able to uh, you know, expose the community to um, the arts and uh, well, at the same time also giving local artists an opportunity to, you know, um, to display their artwork and, you know, share their message with their community um, with then you get into sort of like the shady funding um, and the involvement with the military and the police. And so sort of the positive aspects of the event in contrast with that, as well as what Ron was talking about, which was um, what was going on at the same time as the Watch Rebellion that was fighting against um, the, the police and the military involvement and the way that the police and military have terrorized the community to such a degree, um, where there was this, you know, um, thing that was going on at the same time fighting against that, which resulted in so much not the fighting, but the police involvement in general, which resulted in so much negativity, violence, and um, which changed the form of lives. And so why is it, or what was your thinking throughout your like, um, making uh, of this uh, documentary that you chose to focus on the more positive aspects and highlight those people's stories, which are incredibly important, I agree. Um, but yeah, why, why did you uh, end up, or how did you, what was your thinking that you ended up focusing more on the positive aspects than the just as important negative ones? Well, first of all, the, uh, the conflicts 
that are they're actually in the in the in the in the documentary. Although uh, <clears throat> one thing that you might have might have just gotten from seeing this is when I was cutting between the Muslim brothers and the Martin Luther King poster. And at that time, there was a certain kind of thing of what particular position in terms of the religious community and the black community were you a part of. And uh, I think today, uh, a lot of people who didn't live during that time didn't, don't, doesn't realize that, that there was that kind of conflict. And some of the conflicts that Ron actually had mentioned as well, uh, because after, after King gets knocked off, and then of course Malcolm gets knocked off, you see some of the major black leaders in, in, for the black community that had visibility were getting murdered. And who comes to the, if I can say it this way, who comes to the rescue but the Black Panthers? And it's interesting today how they have this problem with like giving all these people the right to own guns. Well, the Panthers went to the capital of California and they showed up in the uh, state capitol with their weaponry because people at that time in California could own weapons. And when they showed up in the state capitol, the, the state senators immediately passed a ban on having weapons openly out in the public. So to that extent, um, I just want to say that, that what you're referencing in terms of my, if you perceived, I'll put it this way, you perceived joy from people at the festival. Am, am, I, am I correct? Or? I think that's a, that's a good thing, but at the same time, there is the notions of criticality that, that Ron is mentioning that I didn't necessarily have the opportunity to present all of that. I had my own, like I said, I had my own druthers about putting all those military guys in there. In particular, excuse me, sir, about the, your, your military service. Oh, you're not, I'm sorry. Okay, because there was this, because there was Vietnam, folks. You see, and Vietnam shaped that time more than you actually realize today. Uh, for those of us who were that age, who may or may not have went into Vietnam, you know, I had friends who went there, came back never the same, and uh, they're worrying about drugs today. These brothers who went to Vietnam would be just really hooked on some serious drugs. And, uh, you know, we, we have to be careful about, uh, we've got all this freedom. You got freedom to get high, you know. And uh, I think I liked what you said, Ron, about how many people are doing it so much. You know, you can get addicted to marijuana. I mean, come on now. If you, if you, if you, but I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands. How many people getting high? But uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I'm gonna stop running my mouth. I think uh, they're putting the lights on. So. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. We're out of time.